So ancient Babylonia is known amongst us enthusiasts as the birthplace of plumbing. These ceramic pipes formed on a potter's wheel were discovered at the Temple of Bel at Nippur and date from around 4000 BC. The ancient Indus Valley civilization had a complete system of irrigation and sewage by around 2500 BC, and is thus the oldest known sewer system. Washrooms and toilets connected to ceramic pipes, connected to larger brick drains underneath the roads. We still use this basic system and materials today. Ceramic pipes are still used for underground drainage, and brick pipes, although in the last century they've been superseded, thousands of miles of them are still in use. The Romans were the first society known to have public toilets. Consisting of rows of keyhole shapes cut into a stone slab, they offered nothing of the privacy that we so value today. I hope you don't need me to tell you what the top hole is used for, but you may be wondering what purpose the vertical hole in the front serves. Within reach of each head was a tool called a xylospongium. <laughs> After conducting their business, they would employ the front hole to give them access to cleanse their soiled skin using the sponge on a stick. The Romans also, it seems, invented urinals. Emperor Vespasian constructed his pissoirs not for public health or convenience, but as a cash cow. He made their yellow-tinted output available for sale to the cloth-dyeing trade. When challenged on how disgusting the whole thing was, Vespasian famously replied, pecunia non olet, which means money does not stink indicating that whatever the filthy origin of the cash, the money itself is clean. Vespasian is remembered so fondly across southern Europe for his mighty contribution to society that the Italian word for urinal today is Vespasiani. The medieval era appears to be the beginning of shyness and euphemism. Oops. In a castle, the smallest room was known as a garderobe, which means wardrobe. The latrine block of the monasteries of Western Europe was known as a necessarium, or rera dorta, which means the back of the dormitory. Monasteries and other large buildings would often be built directly on top of a small river, and the rera dorta would empty directly into it. Those who do not have the foresight to build their medieval structures directly on top of a watercourse would have to make do with cesspits. These large pits would have had a timber deck constructed over them and apparently had to be emptied by an abseiler. When conveniences were not so convenient, medieval aristocrats would have to make do with a close stool, a type of commode, which means, by the way, convenient. The king himself would even have a servant known as the groom of the stool to assist him with matters of elimination, a role that was only abolished in 1901. Most people, ordinary people, of course, would make do with a pot. As cities grew, the problem of waste became more pronounced. Before the advent of modern sewers, pit toilets were common. Hordes of people known as gong farmers were enlisted to empty them. They were apparently well remunerated, but had to carry out their unpleasant duties during the hours of darkness to assuage the inevitable stench of their foul freight. Politely known as nightmen who transported night soil, they would work in teams a ropeman would lower a bucket down to the holeman inside the pit who would fill it up with what we would now refer to as fecal sludge. These two are the tubmen who would carry the laden containers to the cart. They would then convey to the countryside for fertilizer, flog to farmers, their pungent product. And still today, in many parts of the world, 
the work of the gong farmer is required for a lack of adequate sanitary sewers and indeed sewage treatment plants. Rapidly expanding cities like Manchester began to produce more material than can be used up by the agricultural industry, leading waste to be simply piled into smelly mounds known as middens. These middens grew sometimes very large. Mount Pleasant in North London is said to have been named ironically. <laughs> Early Victorian era public toilets of the midden closet type, like this one, would simply collect the unwanted excreta in a large tank, the design of which has clearly not considered the ergonomics of the gong farmer's trade. A certain Mr. Redgrave, in a speech to the Institute of Civil Engineers in 1876, said that the midden closet represented the standard of all that is utterly wrong, constructed as it is of porous materials and permitting free soakage of filth into the surrounding soil, capable of containing the entire dejections from a house or from a block of houses for months or even years. In the 19th century, the town of Rochdale boasted one of the most advanced human waste management systems ever developed until the spread of municipal sewers toward the end of that century. It used a wooden bucket which was collected weekly by the municipal authorities. The bucket itself would be regularly filled with ash by the householders to keep the environment in the tub dry. 9,100 metric tons of night soil was collected in Rochdale each year from a population of 64,000. It's 142 kilograms per person. At the depot, the unwanted feculence was dried in revolving cylinders using heat from incinerating the rest of the town's refuse. The methane was then burnt off and the remaining clinker was used to make mortar for the building trade. The system worked well. Indeed, there were even people who would ply the streets carrying only a bucket and for a small fee, they would offer use of said bucket, shielding their customers' privacy by wrapping them in a large cloak. Moving now to the modern era, and what could be more representative of modernity than this? Toilet roll. Invented by Seth Wheeler in 1891, this is surely one of the greatest signposts that the 20th century was on its way, and with it, the domination of the ceramic water closet. <laughs> the flush down closet was first described in the 16th century by John Harrington in his treatise, A New Discourse on a Stale Subject. But the invention never gained traction until municipal sewers were widespread. But once they were built, sales of ceramic wash down closets exploded and a huge variety began to appear. Perhaps now, 200 years on, since the founding of the Armitage Sanitary Pottery Company, it's time to take stock of the bathroom of today. I think we can learn something from the heyday of sanitary pottery. The WC pan is perhaps the only architectural feature to have not felt the shock of postmodernism. And perhaps now, is the time for manufacturers to bring the decorative arts back to their designs. <laughs>